There's another one, Todd, up in the corner. Michelle said. She pointed towards the day's 11th intruder, cowering under a fold in the tent ceiling. No pity, no mercy. I brought the wrath of God down upon its head. That's the last of them? Yup, that was the last mosquito on the planet, hun. You're welcome. Well, just in case, throw up that insect repellent thing outside and let's get some fucking sleep. I'm beat. I unzipped the flap and set up the lamp outside and turned it on. It glowed a dim yellow and it pushed back the darkness, just enough to illuminate two other would-be invaders that dipped their wings at the light and flew away. I zipped up the tent flap and said, Reminds me of Passover. Yeah, except I might actually choose death of the firstborn over this shit. Well, we haven't had a kid yet. Exactly. That means we get off scot-free. <sighs> I knew I married you for a reason. Anyway, I'm exhausted. I kissed her and crawled into the bag. Tomorrow we hit the cliff. Tomorrow we hit the cliff. And with that, we fell asleep. Dodd, wake up, kiddo. Uh, it's morning. Ready to rock and roll? Uh, what time is it? 9 a.m. Oh, we're late. We've still got the whole day ahead of us, but I do want to get out there by 10. Yeah. I waved her off and sat up and rubbed my eyes. Oh, I kill for some eggs and bacon right now. Mm, but how about a granola bar? Or a granola bar. Haven't had my fill on those yet. She tossed me one and ate the other herself, and then we unzipped the tent and stepped outside. Then she stopped. Whoa. She leaned over and picked up the repellent lamp and switched it off. How old did you say this thing was? Brand new. I got it last week. Did you get it at a scratch and dent auction? She showed me a large chip along the middle of the glass that definitely hadn't been there before, and which was covered in the unmistakable brown smears of mosquito blood. I took it from her and turned it over in my hands. The hell? I swear to God it was in perfect condition last night. Maybe it was just dark and I didn't notice it. Todd. I looked up and then down and around at where she was pointing. There were at least a hundred dead mosquitoes lying in the dirt. Maybe several hundred. Gross. Let's get a move on before I puke. So I tossed the lamp into the tent. We shouldered up our gear and then we hit the trail. The dirt path wound up out of the campsite where a handful of other hikers had set up shop and then it curled around the crest of a wooden hill and carried on through the forest and up a mountain slope. We spent the walk waving off mosquitoes. Did you bring any bug spray? I slapped my neck for the hundredth time and couldn't help but notice how painful the bites of these particular mosquitoes were. I'm getting eaten alive out here. She sprayed herself down a little and then tossed me the bottle and I almost showered in it. I'm not sure it did much good though. The mosquitoes were out in force. And the further up the mountainside we went, the worse it got. Son of a bitch! Little bastards flew down my shirt! Michelle was slapping at her stomach and waving her t-shirt to force them out from the bottom. I saw one or two fly off. Is this even worth it? I think so. It's muggy down here, but it should clear up when we get to the scramble. Mosquitoes probably aren't going to be swarming anywhere with a good amount of wind. I think we'd need a hurricane at this point. <laughs> right? I feel like that guy from Gulliver's Travels, getting attacked by little people who think he's a giant. What's his name again? A uh, Gulliver? That's the one. But hey, look. She followed my gaze and saw, not a few hundred yards up, the boulders at the top of the mountain. There was even a spot of neon green and one of orange that stood out among the gray. Clearly the jackets of other climbers. Almost there. And there are people up there too. It can't be all that bad. 
The sight of company and open space afforded us a burst of renewed energy, and we walked briskly up to the tree line and out onto the gravel that marked the beginning of the rock's scramble. And that view, no longer obstructed by the forest, we could see how the mountains sloped out majestically and poured out into the countryside. From up here, we could see roads too, and towns, and a patch of woods and farmland stretching out into the valleyed horizon, dotted at the far end with the blue haze silhouettes of other mountains and other hills and other places to explore. We stood and took it all in for a while, and for a moment, We'd forgotten all about the mosquitoes. But then one darted my neck, and I slapped it instinctively and came back to reality. Come on, hun. Still too close to the woods. The rock scramble was a welcome break from all of the hiking. Each pile of arrow marked rocks presented an obstacle that it took skillful teamwork to overcome. And by quarter till we reached the halfway point from the start of the scramble up to the summit. I couldn't help but notice though that the mosquitoes hadn't even slightly let up. I used my arms as much to wave them off as I did to climb. And if I got attacked while engaging both hands for balance or support, I'd have to spit at the damn things to ward them off. Michelle was as agitated as I was how the hell they get up this far? God damn it! I don't know, hon. They're starting to piss me off too. I swatted another one on my cheek and winced at the pain. Maybe it's not windy enough. Uh, maybe. Either that or they're not as put off as the wind as I thought. I hope these things aren't loaded with malaria. She said it half-jokingly, but then she paused at her own thought and turned in my direction. They don't carry malaria, do they, Todd? In the States? No. At least, fuck, I don't think so. I looked down at a freshly smacked mosquito by my boot. It twitched once and then stayed still. Michelle groaned audibly. Isn't it really deadly? Yeah, partly because it's more prevalent in the third world, where they don't have proper medical infrastructure to deal with it. But all the same, yeah, you sure as hell don't want malaria. Well, you're the one who's been here before. Think we should turn back? No. The path loops around the summit, and it's not as heavy wooded on the other side. We've got a better chance of avoiding these things if we just keep going. So on and on we went, up and over the boulders, and getting closer and closer to the peak of the mountain. Mosquitoes harassed our advance the entire way. I tried to be positive for both our sakes, but I had to admit, this wasn't fun anymore. Not even a little bit. Michelle stopped abruptly, about 15 minutes later. Uh, what's wrong? You okay? Those two spots haven't moved at all since we started up. I looked up. She was right. The green and orange spots had stayed perfectly still for the full hour or so since we'd started the scramble. I got a little chill in spite of the heat. Maybe they're just taking a nap. Maybe. I could tell by the quiver in her voice, though, that she didn't believe that for a second. Neither did I. Still, though, on we went, climbing and scrambling, and doing our best to stay focused. We smacked and swatted away at mosquitoes as needed, but their presence was beginning to do more than annoy me. I was getting a bit worried. What the hell are these things? Not for a full second after that thought manifested, we heard a rough commotion a few feet up. We stopped dead in our tracks and shot each other a pair of glances. And then we nearly dove out of the way as the man and his daughter came flying down the mountain and nearly bowled over us in the process. Corey! Hey, what the hell? Corey! The man shouted over his shoulder as he flew on past. We watched the two of them disappear on the other side of the bowlers, and then we looked at each other again. Corey. What the hell is that all about? I don't know. 
Let's just keep moving, okay? I'm getting really sick of this hike. We crested the next few boulders and passed under a stone tunnel, and then we emerged at the bottom of the final rock slab that peaked at the mountaintop. Even from down here, we could see the figures of two people, one in a neon green windbreaker and the other in orange, laying on their backs a few hundred yards away. We moved forward cautiously. Oh, please be sleeping, please be sleeping, please be sleeping. But they weren't, of course. The first proof we had that something was wrong was a faint buzzing coming from their direction. And when we inched even closer, we discovered the sound was emanating from a swirling cloud of maggots above that were indeed a pair of corpses. I retched. Michelle screamed and covered her eyes, and then she turned to me, still bent over with my hands on my knees, and said, Todd, what did that guy say earlier? The one barreling down the hillside? Uh, I don't know. <sighs> Hooray? Or Coray or some- Coray? You mean Coray? I blinked. Sounded right. Yeah, I, I think so. Todd, Coray is Spanish for run. Another chill. I stood up and I blinked, and then I took another glance over at the corpses. Then it hit me. Those aren't maggots. Michelle, we have to go. Now. What? We have to go. Come on. As if on cue, the cloud of mosquitoes lifted up from the corpses and began drifting aggressively in our direction. Michelle shrieked again, and we took off down the mountainside the way we'd come. We leapt over small boulders and slid down bigger ones, risking twisted ankles and broken bones, and then we hit the pay dirt of flat ground and launched ourselves under the tunnel. Behind us, we could hear the howl of incoming mosquitoes that was only amplified by the acoustics of the rock ceiling. Come on! I reached down and yanked Michelle up out of the tunnel, and we hoofed it back towards the slab of the start of the scramble. I stole a glance over my shoulder as we fled and confirmed the intuition that things were gaining ground rapidly. I pumped my arms and legs in sequence as fast as I could, and Michelle did the same, and soon we burst back into the tree line and started half running, half leaping down the dirt and gravel pathway. We flew over rocks and roots, dove under branches, tore through smaller formations of mosquitoes laying in wait for us, and thrashed through the thicket and the shrubs that covered the pathway leading back down the creek. The sound of rushing water gave me an idea that I threw into action without a second thought. Into the water, come on! But we never made it in. Instead, we stumbled to a knee-rattling halt at the edge of the riverbed. Michelle retched this time while I just stood there in disbelief. The man and his daughter who'd flown past us earlier were laying face up in the water, freshly killed and yet already blue and gray and depleted. Their skin stretched tight across the bones, their blood having been drained through a network of uncountable puncture wounds. I dry heaved again, but this time it was Michelle who pulled me to my feet. Todd! I whirled around to see the horde of mosquitoes from the cliffs bearing down on us, and when I turned back toward the river, I saw another group of several hundred likely the ones who killed the father and daughter and then flown off in a search of another meal, flying back upstream, a two-for-one deal having suddenly appeared on their plate. Michelle grabbed me by the left wrist and we splashed through the creek and gained the far bank and continued running, breathing sharply and rapidly, but ignoring that too. All that mattered was getting back to the tent, grabbing the car keys, and getting the hell off this godforsaken mountain. At last, we could see the campsite clearing up ahead of us, and the two of us, long since having shed the weight of our bags on the trail behind us, dove down the last bit of path and into the first row of tents. It was empty here, 
I noticed. Empty and quiet, and I could plainly see several other tents had been opened and ransacked. At no point since we'd arrived had there been fewer than six or eight people milling around, even the busiest climbing hours of early afternoon, but now there were none, and I had no intention of finding out why. I held open the tent flap. Come on, help me out. What the hell are you doing? Those things are right behind us. You want to run all the way home? I left the keys in here so we wouldn't drop them up there on the cliff. Help me find- Todd! I didn't have to turn around to know we'd run out of time. The unmistakable buzzing sound of an incoming fleet of mosquitoes made that perfectly clear. Michelle flew into the tent and I dove in after her and zipped it up fast enough that only a few handfuls of those bastards made it inside as opposed to several thousand. I found the keys and then the two of us whipped and thrashed throughout the tent, smacking our exposed skin whenever a mosquito landed on it and stomping any of them dumb enough to hit the ground. We used whatever we could, books, pans, empty granola bar boxes, to kill the ones on the walls in the tent. And outside, we could hear the buzzing of the other mosquitoes flying up against the canvas. Damn it! I smacked my neck and splattered a large bug that apparently stabbed me with a knife, if the pain was any indication. What the hell kind of mosquito hurts this bad? Michelle didn't answer. She just brought her boot down on three mosquitoes at a time and spat on them. Then she turned to me. What now? I shook my head. Those things are everywhere. I don't know how the hell we're going to get out of here. What about the lamp? I looked at it. It was in piss poor condition at this point, but I knelt down and turned it on. Oh, worth a shot. I'm not dying in here. I looked up just in time to catch a wood green windbreaker she tossed in my direction. It's 90 degrees out there. We'll sweat to death in these things. Not for warmth. She zipped hers up to the chin and threw up her hood. For cover, the less skin we expose, the better. Then she showed me her forearm. It was so red and infected from multiple bites, it looked diseased. I shuddered a bit and then felt my neck. I could tell, even in the absence of a mirror, that I looked just as bad. These mosquitoes aren't normal, are they? She shook her head, although the question was theoretical, and then she rolled up her sleeve to the wrist and pulled the hood tight until I could see only her nose and the glint of her eyes. You ready? Nope. Good, let's get going. I covered up as much as she did and then brought up the lamp. Then she grabbed the zipper of the tent and looked at me. I nodded, and she dragged it down. The mosquitoes flew in, but immediately recoiled at the lamp and hung back a bit, and Michelle and I tore off down the three-mile path towards the parking lot, keeping our heads down as low as we could without losing sight of the road. As we ran through the campsite, I nearly twisted my ankle tripping over pots and pants, shoes, and clothes that had been strewn about in panicked tassel as the crowd fled. I saw a bloodless blue hand too, that of an elderly man from the looks of it. Although it was hard to tell, that was flopped limply out of one of the tents nearest to ours. I swallowed vomit and kept on moving, and behind us we could hear the roar of mosquitoes as they pursued us. I looked down. Shit. The mosquitoes were suicidally ramming themselves into the lamp glass to shut off the light and allow the horde to descend. I waved it around a bit as we ran, but they were insistent and they were determined. And if we didn't make it back to the SUV soon, they'd destroy the lamp. And then Michelle and I would end up like everyone else did. So on and on we ran, huffing and puffing and wheezing. Her blissfully unaware and me hoping and praying that the integrity of the glass would withstand the onslaught until we could make it back to the car. Under branches, 
over rocks and roots and fallen logs, through mud and muck and underbrush and everything you can imagine. And all the while, the mosquitoes bore down on us. We whipped and smacked if they got too close. And at one point, I grabbed a fist-sized rock while flying past it and chucked it into the cloud of insects behind us. But they didn't even blink or even seem to notice. They were driven to fulfill a singular purpose and would either accomplish it or die trying. Todd, look! I did. Off to the side of the road was the smoldering wreckage of a sedan that had been wrapped around a tree. Three of its doors had been hurled open and the interior of it was buzzing with mosquitoes. On the ground, we could see fresh corpses too, turned gray and blue with bloodlessness. Then another figure, a woman in her mid-thirties, spilled out of the driver's seat and crawled around on all four broken limbs, hacking and wheezing and grabbing at her throat. Even from the increasing distance between us, I could see and hear a withering mass of insects in her mouth. Oh God, Michelle, she's choking on those damn things. We can't just leave her here. Are you out of your mind? We go, go back there to throw her on our, our backs and we're all dead. I noticed the slur in her words and was about to ask, but then I heard a muffled scream and shot another glance over my shoulder, just in time to see a detachment of mosquitoes break off from the cloud pursuing us and descend on the poor woman. I heard another shriek, I heard thrashing, and then I heard nothing but the constant hum of a hundred thousand buzzing wings. She was gone, and all the while the cloud inched closer and closer. The low hum turned into a roaring, overwhelming, all-consuming buzz. I doubled my efforts. I felt like my lungs were about to burst, like every muscle in my body was about to deflate and slide off the bone. My breath was short, it was rapid, and it was sharp. It hurt in my chest and in my throat, and we were still a good mile away from the parking lot, which for all we knew may have already been ransacked by half a million mosquitoes, or may have been blocked off at the interstate ramp by panicked, fleeing hikers. But we'd cross that bridge when, or if we ever reached the damn thing. I looked over at Michelle. She was in even worse shape than me. Sweating, gray, gasping for air in short, raspy breaths. Her gait was lumbering and awkward, and she appeared to struggle to mount minor obstacles in her way like roots and stones. It instantly became apparent that whatever venom these mosquitoes carried was stacking on top of the exhaustion and beginning to work its magic on her at an accelerated rate. She was slowing down, struggling to move, and covered in red, pestering welts. Her head began to dip and sway, and then her knees buckled and she stumbled forward. I reached out, and grabbed her arm and yanked her back up, and then I used my body to keep hers upright as we staggered our way to safety. <sighs> Come on, babe. Just a bit more, okay? All my energy and all my strength of arms was bent on just getting us to the damn SUV. Half a mile. I could feel the keys jingling in my pocket. A quarter. I could almost smell the interior of the cabin. A fifth. I began throwing together a plan to get both of us secured in the front seats and have the damn thing locked down in the Olympic seconds we'd have between our reaching the door handles and the mosquitoes doing the same. A tenth. Come on, you son of a bitch. Move. My legs were numb, but all of a sudden, there it was. The parking lot. I could see the sunlight glint off the roof of the sedan. I got a burst of renewed energy and flew down the last patch of dirt and gravel, carrying an increasingly immobile Michelle behind me. I grabbed the key and disengaged the locks, and then I threw Michelle into the passenger seat, and before running around the hood, 
and almost leaping headfirst into the driver's side, getting bit and pelted the whole way and slamming the door just as a wall of mosquitoes rammed up against all of the windows with an enormous collective splat. The insects kept up their assault, hitting the windows in waves, and it sounded like a rainstorm. I took a mount after killing the handful of mosquitoes that slipped in with us to gasp for breath and regain some composure. Then I shot a glance at Michelle and found her almost catatonic, struggling to breathe and move. Her eyes were wide and her hand was struggling to make a fist. Michelle! I leaned over and felt her pulse. Rapid. Hard. She was alive. But if the foam at the corners of her mouth was any indication, she might not be for long. So I threw the key in the ignition and turned it and slammed my boot onto the gas pedal. Come on, come on, move, damn it. I did my best to ignore the slurs in my own speech and focused on getting us out. The tires whirred and screeched, and then we were off, carrying a horde of mosquitoes behind us. They did their best to keep up, I'll give them that, but by time we rounded the corner that led to the main road, the insect cloud and the constant buzzing were beginning to drift away into the rearview mirror. Fuck! I slammed on my brakes so hard the SUV almost flipped over onto its roof. It shuddered and shook and then rattled to a halt. And Michelle and I lurched forward with all of the momentum and almost smacked our heads up against the dashboard and the upper half of the wheel. I made sure Michelle was still secure, and then I took a moment to stare out at the scene ahead of me. It was a massacre. There were motorcycles, cars, minivans, and bicycles laying all over the road and off to the sides. Blinking hazards glowed through the fog in sequence. Doors were thrown open. Luggage and gear tossed all over the ground. There were bodies too, dozens of them. In fact, men, women, and children. All spilled out of their seats and drained of blood and fluids and set in torturous, final positions. Slowly and cautiously, I released my foot from the brake and the SUV rolled forward at a snail's pace. It carried me straight down the road, between the wreckage, and on the sides I could see the corpses in more detail. Some were still twitching. Others look nearly mummified by drainage. They all have one thing in common, an enormous mid-torso wound that pierced the spine so as to paralyze each victim for a feast. I didn't have to be an expert to put two and two together. No normal mosquito, or even a thousand of them, could have done that. Something else was out here, something worse. I scanned the horizon and applied a little more pressure to the gas to pick up speed gradually. Instead of attracting whatever it was to my location with a roaring engine, 5 miles per hour, 10, 15, the monstrous images started to whiz on by at a sharp cruising pace, 20 miles per hour, 25. I turned my head to the left and saw a half-dead body flop up and down as a spear-sized stinger was inserted and removed from its abdomen. Then a cloud of mosquitoes burst out of the fog and descended on it, and my gaze drifted upwards, and I caught my breath. Of all of the things I'd seen that day, from the coated mummified corpses on the mountain, to the man laying face up in the river, to the crippled woman choking to death on mosquitoes near the bodies of her loved ones, nothing and I do mean nothing, was as hideously grotesque as the car-sized, stinger-equipped mosquito hovering like an attack chopper over the wreckage of a minivan. I retched. I withheld a scream, and in panic, I released my foot from the brake, and the SUV rolled forward again. I went along with it, and decided a hasty retreat to the main road was the appropriate route. But the mosquito caught wind of our presence instantaneously and shot over in our direction. Oh, fuck. 
I slammed the gas for a second time, and the SUV fell into gear and rocketed off with a shudder while the mosquito was still closing the gap. Oh, move, move, move. But it was far too quick, and once it reached the SUV, it planted all six of its massive, hairy legs onto the rear of the vehicle and beat the air with its wings. I could feel the momentum of the car shift, the tires spun, my foot was on the gas, and the pedal was on the floor, but it was no use. The SUV started to roll backwards with an ear-splitting screech. Then at the worst possible moment, a fresh horde of mosquitoes swept in and out of the fog and consumed the front end of the car like a quilt. I threw the windshield wipers on a desperate countermeasure, but they wouldn't budge under the weight of the assault. Then more mosquitoes piled on to push the advance. Then more. And more. Sunlight was thoroughly blotted out, and all I could hear was the deafening sound of 50,000 roaring wings. The glass began to bend, then it began to buckle, and then ever so slightly at first, but rapidly spreading, it started to crack. Michelle squeezed my hand with the last of her strength. I tried to squeeze back, but it hurt. The venom was taking its course on me too, and if Michelle's immobility and consciousness was any indication, I'd guess whatever paralytic agent this was going to keep us both alive and aware while the mosquitoes had their way with us. I squeezed my eyes shut and thought of home, of being a kid, of falling in love. I whirled around just in time to see the trunk of the SUV get ripped clean off by the mosquitoes, which then shoved a wirely leg towards the front of the car. I swatted at it, but it was sharp and coarse, and hurt me more than it hurt it. As soon as I winced back in pain, the leg wrapped around my right wrist and yanked me out of the seat towards itself. Michelle watched and trembled, but could do nothing as I was dragged across the seatless rear area, kicking and screaming and wailing. I bumped into boxes and bags and smacked my head against the ceiling in the struggle. And when I was almost out, almost inside the damn thing's mouth, I felt my hand brush against the cold, chipped glass of something small. I looked down, the lamp. I grabbed it with my free hand and turned around. The mosquito's hideous, dangling sucker stinger was darting for my abdomen. I didn't hesitate. There was no time for panic. I swung the lamp up and forward, and I brought the wrath of God down upon its head. The glass already chipped and worn out from the events of the last 24 hours completely exploded. Shards flew in my face and near my eyes but I could tell by the sudden release of pressure around my arm and waist, and from that bizarre shriek let out by the mosquito, that I'd caused far more damage than to myself. It dropped me, and I smacked the rib on the edge of the car as I fell and spilled out onto the dirt. Meanwhile, the mother writhed and beat the air frantically and furiously with her wings. Glass shards were lodged deep throughout her head, and her sucker hung by a thread of slime. She rolled around and clawed at her head with her arms, while I crawled back into the SUV and jumped into the driver's seat and threw it into gear. Come on, don't fail me now, baby. Come on, move. The SUV jumped and shuddered and shook, but it got rolling, and I wasted no time exploiting the chaos the mother's death had sown through the ranks of the mosquito's horde. Five miles per hour, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30. The images of the chaos and the carnage flew past me. By now the mosquitoes had regained some of their composure and had given chase, but it was too late. The fog had begun to lift. I could see the main road now. 40 miles per hour, 50. 65. We were free. I looked at Michelle. She had a white knuckled death grip on the edge of her seat 
and one hand planted firmly against the passenger window. White foam had started to pile up at the corners of her mouth, and her breaths were short and shallow, but her eyes were open wide and aware. She was still with me for however long we had. We were pulled over by an officer for the state of the car. When he saw what happened, he escorted us to the emergency room. Michelle and I were treated with anti-venom with seconds to spare. In her case, and for a host of bruises, scrapes, cuts, and fractures. But we were alive. We made it through that nightmare in one piece, more or less. Over the course of the next few weeks, I heard stories of other survivors, battered and shaken, and with stories not too dissimilar from ours. Authorities investigated, and I'm not really sure what came of place after that, but I didn't care. I had Michelle, I had all four limbs, and not more than a handful of scars to show for the ordeal, and that was enough. I will say this though, I think I'm done hiking for a while. Maybe I'll pick up stamp collecting.